Lake Titicaca. In this magnificent stark landscape of the Bolivian highlands lies a beguiling mystery. Lake Titicaca is so powerful. It's deep, it's vast. There are places where you don't see land. We're at 13,000 feet above sea level. Most people think you really can't even live at that altitude, much less have an entire city. Tiwanaku is unique. There's nothing like it in the world. When you look at these huge stone blocks and these giant monoliths, you just question, where did these things come from? Tiwanaku is a mystery, but there's been no shortage of explanations. He believes that giants did it. He truly believes that giants put these stones in place. Since I've been here in Bolivia, I would say about a million and a half dollars have been invested in people looking for extraterrestrial life based on Tiwanaku. Wait, you don't buy the alien thing? I don't buy the alien thing. And these are just a few, few ideas here that will not die. I'm an archaeologist. I've been working in Bolivia since 1995. I wanted to put these pseudo ideas to rest. The big problem was we have Tiwanaku on one side of the lake. We have the source of the stone on the other side of the lake. I'm not an expert, and I'm certainly not an archaeologist. But with so much water, the obvious choice is boats, ships, to carry these stones. But the problem was very little trees, no real source of wood. So how could boats have been built that would have carried these kinds of stones across that lake? The answer to me was obvious, reeds. The fishermen along the shores of Lake Titicaca have been used in reed boats for thousands of years. This is archaeology, but it's archaeology with a twist. Literally, we're going to try to reconstruct an aspect of the past and see how it works. We decided to build a boat and see if we could actually transport these huge stones from one side to the other. Only one catch. You just can't use modern tools. We can only use technology that was available to the people 2,000 years ago. It's all trial and error. We have our methods, we have our theories, we have some good ideas, but it's a grand experiment. We don't know what's going to happen. It is cold, it is desolate, and at this altitude, it is hard to breathe. Walk across one of these valleys, walk across the Tiwanaku Valley, it seems completely barren, and all of a sudden you're confronted with the remains of a once great city. This is sort of the middle of nowhere right now, but during the pre-Columbian period, this was the wealthiest area of the entire Andes. Whoever controlled the Titicaca Basin controlled the Andes. And for 500 years, Tiwanaku controlled the basin, and its influence was felt throughout the southern Andes. When early scholars first visited these ruins, the standing stones evoked a memory of an equally mighty and mysterious place in the British Isles, and named these monuments the American Stonehenge. We're talking about an amazingly developed culture that didn't have writing, or at least didn't leave us anything we could understand. We only have the archaeological remains. Yeah. Scientific excavations began in Tiwanaku over a hundred years ago. For years, people assumed that Tiwanaku was an uninhabited ceremonial center. Now, with years of archaeological research, we realize that for 500 years, this city was the largest one in the continent. This project builds on over a century of serious archaeological work. This comes in contrast to a field I call pseudo or fringe archaeology, where a huge amount of money has been invested in trying to connect these ruins to aliens or lost tribes or basically any other source other than the people that actually live there. The stones that we were interested in were made of andesite. The source of the stones are located on the other side of the lake. There's one monolith at Tiwanaku, a very famous monolith called a Bonse monolith, made out of andesite. We're going to try to find something like this over the other side of the lake, these dimensions, and drag it over here. 
We chose the Bonsi monolith because it's such an iconic piece of Tiunaco. Weighing in at nine tons, it was a perfect size for our experiment. So we set out to solve the mysteries of the stones of Tiwanaku. No aliens, no giants, just a lot of hardworking people with some really innovative technology and some really great ideas. Building a boat out of almost two million plants, basically, just puzzled me. I wanted to see exactly how this thing was put together, especially considering the job that we had before us. We start with these Totora reeds. The process of cutting Totora is not simple. So you use a tool with a blade on the end of it that can reach very deep into the water and cut the Totora about 12 inches above the soil. If you do that and you do it properly, that tutorial will continue to grow and it'll be ready to use again within a year. Once the reed is brought to the land, it is laid out in the sun where it can dry for three weeks. That whole process is very critical and everybody participates in it. We gather them up in bundles, or amaros. Amaros is the Aymara measurement that uh, really means big enough for an Aymara adult to wrap both arms around it. You take several of those bundles and you join them together until you have one long cigar-shaped roll, about 50 feet long. Our boat's gonna have about 35 of these long cigar-shaped rolls. So that's really about 3,000 bundles, 1,800,000 reeds. That's a lot of tutorial. Right now we're probably about 40, 30, 40 minutes away from uh, Watahata where our boat is. I'm sure when we get there I'm going to be surprised at what I see today. Every day it takes on a different shape. Right now, it just looks like two giant rolls, but there's much more than that inside of it. If you're looking back up there, you can see we actually have two bodies, or two sections. What you don't see is a third section, which is the heart of the boat, in between these two bodies. They actually alternate wrapping the ropes around one side and the heart, then the other side and the heart, and they do that all the way through. What they do is they come to each one of these ropes and they hook another rope to it and they've got about four or five people pulling on it as tight as they can and they take all the slack out of it. As they're pulling it, they've got people with poles or logs and they're beating on it to push it down even more at the same time that they're pulling on it. You see a little bit up there, it's tearing the Totora. They don't want to tear the Totora. They're going to mess it up a little bit, but it won't hurt the boat. And, yet, and it is extremely tight and this is very solid. When it's finished, our boat's gonna be about 50 feet long, 15 feet wide, and six or seven feet tall. And it's gonna weigh about 12 tons, 12 tons dry. Once we put the boat in the water, it's gonna absorb some water, and that's a good thing, because that's gonna make it more buoyant. But our boat's gonna weigh about 15 tons. They built this boat the same way they build the smaller boats. Just more Totora, more rolls, more of everything, obviously. And I spent a considerable time in the smaller boat. I had to really understand what was taking place. Estudiante? Ah, buen estudiante. That boat drafted very little. Now, in terms of percentage and in terms of amount, I can't tell you, but it was truly tiny. This was about a 10, 12 foot boat. I could not have flipped that boat if I wanted to. This is very responsive. Surprises me. It's very easy to handle. I'm going to see if I can roll this the way they do modern whitewater kayaks. Just I'm so trying to prove that modern kayaking was invented by the Tiwanakans you know, a thousand years ago, and they did it in, in Totora reed boats. These people watching me try to flip this boat 
What went through their mind? I don't know how you'd say it in Aymara, but I'm sure they thought that I had a screw loose. I think that's enough. Okay, Paul. Perhaps these people didn't invent whitewater kayaking, but one thing for sure is the integral part these boats have in the lives of the lakeside communities. What's special about Bolivia is the high indigenous population. About 60% of the population of Bolivia is indigenous. You see a lot of men and women in traditional dress. You'll see a lot of women wearing the traditional boyera dress, which is a large, poofy dress, and that bowler hat, which really nobody knows when that started up, but hats are very important in the Andes. The Aymara have been living in the Titicaca Basin for thousands of years. They connect very strongly with the ruins. They recognize that as parts of their heritage and their identity. The first time we went out to Copacabana, we had just the perfect and typical Bolivian moment. This is the major highway, one of the only highways to international borders. And about halfway through the trip, there's traffic everywhere and we stop. And we're wondering, is this an accident? Is there some sort of political strife? Not at all. It's a parade. One village doing a parade to another village. Marty in the middle of the street. Traffic stopped on both sides. Nobody cares. Welcome to Bolivia. This doesn't make sense. But we're going to be heading over here. We're going to be going. Geologists had identified the Copacabana Peninsula as a source of the andesite stones, which presented us with a few problems right away. We had to decide were we going to go Peru or were we going to go Bolivia? The Copacabana Peninsula is actually divided in two by the Peru-Bolivia frontier. Copacabana. But now, if we actually have to go into Peru, you're talking about going into Peru to find the stone, then we have bigger problems. Exactly. We have to go get from the Peruvian authorities permission to cross Peruvian waters. If we can solve it by staying in Bolivian waters for the moment, Bolivian land and Bolivian waters, it'll just make things easier. We thought we're gonna probably have to stick to Bolivia which didn't mean we didn't have our share of problems. We had to go and ask permission, not only ask permission from the local government, but also ask permission from the local shamans that continue to use the site. Unless we had full clearance from everyone, we could have a disaster. Copacabana is a sacred location. What happens when two guys in a Totora boat pull up and try to yank one of these big stones? Would they allow us to do it? This is going to be our location of choice. All we have to do right now is spend some time looking around for the right rock with the right structure, the right color, and the right size. What I've got here is about it's less than two feet at the thickest part. Not, not wide enough. That's a big shoot. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Yeah. Shoot. All right, well, let's look. I mean, there's plenty of stones here. We need something that's about 10 feet tall and about three feet thick. That's what we were looking for. How about this one? I don't like that rock. I don't like the truck. Uh, it's, it's big, and, I mean, it's big. It's what we were afraid of like is that once you started digging to try to move that stone, you could have double that size underneath the ground. Ten guys. You figured it'd be easy to find the stone considering the entire peninsula consists of the type of material we're looking for. But it turns out it was actually a little bit more challenging. We needed the right stone. And we weren't going to go quarry this stone like they do in modern times. We are going to do it the way they did it back then. That's what the Inca did. They went through all these landslides and carefully chose the stone they wanted to. We've been here for half an hour, so I think we still have a little bit more work cut out for us. So we spent all this time looking for the perfect stone down by the water and couldn't find what we were looking for. We were going to have to go a little bit higher. We get there and I think, okay, well this is gonna be a piece of cake. 
looks nice, right size. We sort of picture the Ponce monolith being inside. Like Michelangelo described his sculptures, sort of something waiting to be freed from the stone. And we went to the other side, and there's a fault running right through the middle of it. It looks like we have a fracture going all the way through the rock. So this stone over here may not be the one we're looking for at the moment. To find that exact perfect stone that didn't have too much weight, too little weight, or a fault line going through it, how many stones did we look at? Literally hundreds, and it took us weeks. Come on, Stan. Bien, 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 come on. This is our stone. Es un es más que pensado. ¿Cuánto pesa piensas? Por lo menos nueve y medio. Nueve y medio. Nueve es como dos y medio. A nine-ton stone is huge. He didn't say it, but I could tell he was thinking it. What have I gotten myself into? When we talked to the boat builders and we told them the stones from Copacabana were transported to Tiwanaku, and we think that it was done on Totora boats, but do you think that we can actually transport a nine-ton stone? I came up with a way to do everything, so I thought I had pretty good ideas. The Aymara kind of laughed at me. I was trying to show them, and they're just looking at me like, we know how to do this stuff. What are you talking about? And they found it humorous that I was trying to tell them how to do some of these things, as if I figured out something that was new. After a while, my job was just to sit back and watch them figure out how to make it work. My interest as an archaeologist was to see how the Aymara, the descendants of the Tiwanaku, would actually go about doing such a task. They too were experimenting with this technology because they hadn't built anything of this size in over a thousand years. So as the experiment went on, they tried a variety of different methods, and as usual, the simplest ended up being the most correct. Oh, that's a great idea. That puts everybody that's working on this on land and leaves a boat, which is not a whole lot of room there, completely free. They had a method they knew, and now they're going to take it to the absolute technological limit. So the big question was, is it going to sink or not? And they're like, no, no, it's not going to sink, even though this is going to be the most amount of weight they take on a boat this size. They're absolutely sure it will not sink. <laughs> but we need to ask this every time we come here. We're supposed to put the boat in the water. Originally, we were going to have 60 people do it. Last night, they're telling me 30 people. This boat weighs 12 tons. Uh, originally, we were going to start at 8 o'clock. Now we're starting at 9 o'clock. It's going to take a, a couple hours still to get the boat in the water. Uh, yeah, I'm a little worried. I'm a little worried. <laughs> we don't want any friction against the bottom of the boat as we're dragging it and pushing it, because it'll tear up the bottom of the boat. So there are going to be two tracks, just like a train track. And then we're going to put logs crosswise, stationary. The, the logs will be attached to the boat, and we're going to slide the boat along the tracks so the bottom of the boat doesn't actually incur any friction, and then we'll take it down to the water that way. So many people showed up to help us put that boat in the water, more than we expected, but it's a good thing because we needed every one of them. The first time we pulled on it, we probably moved this two feet. And that first two feet seemed so easy that the next push and pull was maybe two inches. And that's what we did for 100 yards. Just to get an appreciation of how heavy our boat really was, it's like pulling 12 small cars. But it's not that simple. Take those 12 cars, take the wheels off, put them inside the trunk, inside the car, and then try to drag all 12 of them at the same time. 
that's what it was like. I see this thing gaining momentum. And when we're done, we're going to have plenty of room because that house is going to be gone. <laughs> For the first time, we realized it started rolling on its own. So the command was, uno, dos, tres. And I don't know if they were yelling pull or push after that, but one thing was for sure, everybody there knew what uno, dos, tres meant. Here we are moving this boat. We turn it downhill. It was so hard to pull and move this 12-ton boat. Jesus. We can't control the movement of this. We pull, we push, we step back. We had people in front of the boat, we had people in back of the boat, and there were issues of danger that we really didn't take into consideration. We've just discovered that we're the most dangerous part of this. Now, instead of inches and inches, it's now feet by feet. And it hit that adobe wall and obliterated it. Everybody stopped. Jesus. <laughs> Now we're so close to the water, and it's been about four or five hours to go 100 yards. And when the tip of that boat got to the water, everybody knew it. It would take one final push. Oh, come on, come on, come on! Holy sh**. <laughs> Imagine our excitement, our boat's in the water, and we were supposed to set sail that day. And that's what the media reported. As far as everybody else was concerned, they heard that we were on our way to pick up our rock but our boat wasn't ready. Some things are not finished. What, do I, what else do I have? How many, how many oars do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. We have oars that we could possibly use as a rudder, but with a boat this size, these oars are too small to do what we need to do with it. The rudder was going to be significantly larger, uh, probably three times as big as any one of these oars. We're actually missing some of our oars. We're supposed to have eight, and we've got five. <laughs> he said we needed some pulleys to pull the, uh, the, the sails up. We can't use pulleys. <laughs> they didn't have pulleys back then. <laughs> So he said he'll come up with something, I, and I knew he would. We're going to go ahead and hit the water and see what happens. All right. I made the decision to set sail without a completed boat for various reasons. My goal was just to sail across to this other island where we could make the changes that we needed to make. We had an opportunity to go ahead and learn a little bit about this boat while we were still correcting it. However, there were some problems that, that, that I didn't expect. Lake Titicaca is not lake sailing. It's ocean sailing. It's ocean conditions. We have winds of more than 40 knots at times. Lake Titicaca is almost 5,300 square miles. In places, it's nearly 1,000 feet deep. This is more like an ocean than a lake. It's easy to see how the locals believe that Lake Titicaca is a living, breathing creature. We heard stories about people falling in the lake and others trying to rescue them, only to be held back. They didn't fall in the lake. 
Lake Titicaca claimed them. And to save them would be to anger the lake. Don't expect to get rescued. You're on your own. Perfect, perfect. A storm comes up. We have winds up to probably 40 knots, but it blew so hard. All of a sudden, the rudders came undone from the boat. Imagine the frustration. The mast almost blew down. We were losing everything on the boat. We were just hugging on to the oars with everything we had. We couldn't control it. We actually had to drop the sails, try to drop anchor, and wait the storm out just to save the boat and to save ourselves and keep it in one piece. We're surrounded by snow-capped mountains. The water's cold. If we would have fallen in and wouldn't have been able to get back to the boat or wouldn't have been able to get out, we would have succumbed to hypothermia in a matter of minutes. Our hands were bleeding. They were cracked. It was an adrenaline of fear and of disappointment. I didn't know what to do. That storm caused so much damage to our boat. We simply couldn't continue sailing anymore. I got on my phone and I called Alexi. Hey, man. Uh, this boat's falling apart. We, we got to make some decisions. When Paul called me, my response was clear. We can't risk any aspect of this project. But I wasn't there. We were still excavating back at Tiwanaku, and I didn't see the terrible effects that the storm had had on the boat. We can't wait 24 hours. We, we need some help. In the state that that boat was in, our options were sit there and continue taking abuse by the elements every day and watch the boat get destroyed, or seek a modern solution. I told him, get a tow. But tow the boat up to the last point that you were able to reach under the traditional navigation. That was the lowest part of the entire project for me. It was a huge defeat. It was very, very emotional. It was very tough. The last thing any sailor wants is to be towed. From what I understand, it's going to take possibly five days to make the repairs and corrections to this boat to make it seaworthy. Five days is a lot of time. I'm worried about what it's going to do to this boat while this boat is sitting in the water. So there's a tremendous amount of work that has to be done here. This rope uh, is one continuous loop that ties the two bodies to the heart of the boat. This one popped last night in, this, in, in the strong wind that we had. I'm sure what that has to mean is that this starts coming loose and all of this starts coming loose. I am not a boat builder. I just can't believe that this rope should snap this fast, this easy. I, and, and we saw when they were building the rope and pulling it tight that it snapped a couple times. I just don't know what all has been done wrong with this boat. I mean, it could be such a great boat and uh, these little things that are going wrong should not be going wrong. After the boat was fixed, from there to Copacabana, 25 miles, it took less than three days. By the time I got on the boat, Paul had made all the repairs and it was sailing perfectly. After three months of waiting, I was finally on this boat. We got within eyesight of Copacabana when the wind died. Everybody grabbed an oar. Everybody was paddling with everything they had. It was an absolute dream for me. I'd done it a hundred times before on motorized boats, but to do it the way that I'd read about that had been described in the historic chronicles, for me, it was an actual voyage into the past. It was an incredible, beautiful day. It's indescribable. It was great the day that I left Tequina. Everybody was coming up to me saying, oh, good luck, good luck, but it's gonna take you seven to 10 days, or you're not gonna make it, because this is the most dangerous part of the trip. Here we are, less than three days later. 
We're going to put the stone on the boat, and then on Sunday, we're going to take off and head back to Tiwanaku, where we need to go. This location is perfect. We had deep water all the way to the shore, so we could pull the boat close to the shore. But it wasn't as simple as that. We need to make it as easy as possible to transfer this stone to our boat. What we had to do is build a ramp. Imagine, in modern terms, a dock. Using the terrain as it already was, we just moved stones out of the way, put them in their place, flattened it out, made a clear path so that we could slide our stone from up above on the hill all the way down to the ramp. This process may sound simple, but we've got to move not only our nine ton stone, but we've got to move hundreds and hundreds of 50 pound stones, 100 pound stones, 200 pound stones, one ton, two ton, three ton stones, just to build our ramp. And we're doing this with completely natural means, no modern equipment. Each part of this journey was marked by a ceremony to appease the local gods, the spirits, and all the other sacred aspects. One thing to understand about the Aymara and this area of the Andes is that there's this incredible combination of Catholicism brought over by the Spanish and the idea that the Aymara had of what their landscape consisted of. And in this landscape, there were a lot of things that were alive. In effect, the entire landscape is alive, the lake, the mountains, the clouds, and one of those things was our rock. Es una persona mayor que tiene que emprender de viajar. Tiene que bajar suavemente, suavemente. We weren't transporting a rock. We were actually bringing something that was alive from one sacred place to another. And to do so, we had to also do the proper ceremonies. Para que la piedra ha bajado bien, le están ofrendando con la coqueta, haciendo pichar un poco de descanso and perhaps to convince it to come with us a little bit more gently, we also gave it some alcohol. They said, we're trying to get this off the mountain. He's being a little stubborn, but if we give him a little bit of alcohol, just like a friend coming out of a party, we put an arm over each shoulder and we sort of delicately bring him out the door. We got some movement. We got ourselves here at, what is it, 30 degree angle? Yeah, it's going to go shooting down the hill. Tons. Tons. If that picks up speed, that's going to pick up speed. We're not even trying to stop it. We can't stop it. This is going to take a little while here. We had people pushing from above with levers, and there were those of us down below pulling with ropes. Obviously, those above were much safer than those of us below. My thoughts are going through my head. Can this stick really move a nine-ton stone? Can I have any effect on where the stone is going to end up? Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Wow. Once that happened, we ran into our next problem. The ramp is a little bit too low. They think they'd be able to make it uh, all the way up, but we're worried about damage to the detour of the boat. So we're going to actually start moving it. Some people are going to start moving the boat over here. They're going to start accommodating. Everybody else is going to start dragging the stone down up to the point we get to the ramp. And then we're going to the next position where we have to see how we're going to actually put it on the boat. Yeah. Simon, Simon, let's
Sí, sí, sí. Yeah. Uno, Marino, cuente. Dos, sí, tres. Otra. Ya. Dos, sí, tres. Dos, sí, tres. Llevando. Moving the stone to the boat was the most physically exhausting part of the project. And after pulling and pushing for hours, we decided we'd start fresh the next day. We were determined to load the stone as quickly as possible, but the stone would prove to be more challenging than we thought. Also, this is the trickiest part of the expedition and the place most likely to lose the stone and damage the boat. For sure. This is, right here is the toughest part of the entire project. Listo. <laughs> Not a good sound. The stone is moving too. <laughs> it's crunching? Not crunching, just moving. Even though if this does collapse, it's not we're still not very safe here. I'm talking about fragments of wood flying all over the place. Man. I know. We're gonna hear a lot of creaking and cracking and stuff like that, I think. No, we'll stick around here. Everybody gave everything they had to get the stone to the boat. We even had the Bolivian Navy pulling as the Aymara were pushing. We had the stone on the ramp suspended above the water. First of all, was the ramp even going to hold the stone? The stone's four feet away from being on the boat. We looked at each other and said, it's going to hold, right? The sound, I don't know if it was wood cracking, Totora giving, it was a sound I've never heard before. And when we finally got it there, it was such a relief and such a celebration. Everybody just broke out cheering and clapping and hugging each other. Everybody became one. It was just a sight to see. We've just finished placing the big stone on the boat. Right now we're doing some final final preparations for it. We're going to sail it over to the Navy base right around the corner here. We're going to have a small ceremony, at which point we're going to work a little bit more on the boat, getting a few more things done, and we're calculating three more days. They just don't want to leave tonight. Uh, they just don't know the winds. And to tell you the truth, they're a little bit scared. Between the winds not being as precise as they know it, and not knowing where to drop anchor between the sheer walls going up there, they just don't want to leave tonight. So uh, I'm a little bit disappointed, but we're going to start up tomorrow at 7 in the morning. We were desperate to leave. The stone was already on the boat, but the weather had turned against us. In the meantime, our boat kept sinking deeper and deeper into the water. Part of the crew was afraid to sail the deepest part of the lake in such a strange boat, and the other part of the crew had gotten ill. Yesterday evening, uh, it hit me hard. It was just chills and fever. I don't know what it was, food poisoning, but I wasn't the only one. A lot of my crew members were sick. Some of the locals were sick, and all that was doing was feeding the superstition. People were afraid to sail with us, and uh, we're having a hard time finding anybody that wants to do the trip out of fear, out of, out of whatever. And it's, kind of, it's really strange, very awkward. We don't know what's going on. Yeah. They're going to come back with voodoo dolls of each one of us with pens stuck in us, and, and this whole country is going to be afraid of us or something. Traveling is about, and doing things is about challenges, but we need to get out of here. We made the decision to leave. At 2 o'clock in the morning, we set sail with half a crew, not knowing what to expect, facing the superstition and the fears of everybody around. But there was no other choice. Had to do it. It was just so stressful. At other times, there's no place in the world you'd rather be. 
This part of the sail was perhaps the most spectacular of all. The winds were the most consistent. They stayed with us in our favor the majority of the day. They were strong. This boat was flying. This is exactly the way a sailor wants a boat to move. I was trying to solve an archaeological mystery. How did stone get from one place to another? Personally, I'm not a sailor. I thought it was interesting being on that boat. I really didn't like it that much. I'd much rather be excavating. But you're the one who wanted to sail that boat. It's my boat. OK, it's our boat. But it was my boat. Well, shoot, if I had my way, I'd probably still be on that boat. Why? You know, what was it about that boat? That was my baby. I was, I was very much a part of it. As we approached the shore close to Tiwanaku, the local fishermen joined us. They were so enthusiastic that I turned over the command of the boat and let them sail her into the canal. As we arrived, we had our greatest reception yet. Everybody joined, small children, men, women. Everybody wanted to participate. One thing we gotta make note here, this is a community work. All these people are here to help out. We didn't ask them to come. Uh, they heard about this, they all came down. They all really wanna do this. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> Paul, good, good job. <laughs> you get this? For the people here, our arrival was a sacred event. This is a stone from Copacabana, a very important place in Bolivia. Coming out and helping us move this stone was sort of an act of faith. Now we have to take the stone off the boat. We have some experience with this now. We're using the levers to push. We're using ropes to pull. We're using water and algae to decrease the friction so we can move the stone easier. These simple technologies, with the experience we've gained over a few weeks, allowed us to move the stone off the boat in a fraction of the time it took us to put it on the boat. We're pulling on the rope with everything we've got. And the rope slipped off the rock, and everybody fell down. I was so worried that somebody would get hurt until everybody started laughing. Everybody was having a blast. Before we started, people doubted that we could do this project. And as we continued, the doubters grew in numbers. Even the builders of the boat doubted that we could do it after the boat was completed. My hope is that this project has a permanent and lasting effect. But in reality, this is just the first step. One thing for sure, I'm going to be here for the next few years trying to change people's misconceptions about Tiwanaku and the capacity of indigenous peoples. So this was an opportunity to recuperate technologies that were slowly being lost as globalization is taking over in the area. We actually gave them the guidelines. You just can't use modern tools. You can't use anything that they didn't have in the pre-Columbian period. And based on that, we could see how actual existing technologies, knowledge passed down from father to son, from mother to daughter, were actually being reapplied in this project. It's so funny, last night, uh, we had lots of offers to stay in town. People wanted to take care of us, and uh, every bit of this team wanted to stay and spend one more night on the boat, because it might have been our last night on the boat. And every one of us did that. I mean, we spent over three months on this. It's kind of sad. I mean, it's like we're losing a home. We truly spent so much time on this boat. <laughs> Siete años para ganar, hermano Naka. 
This meeting has been going on for half an hour. We have the uh, mayor in, of Tiwanaku, who's also in charge of the whole area, talking with the uh, people from the local community here and trying to see exactly what they're going to be doing with the stone and with the balsa. The stone is probably going to stay here. The people here really want it. They say it's good luck to have it here. It'd be very bad luck for it to leave. As for the uh, balsa, we're trying to see exactly what they like to do with it. Within six months, this thing is going to decay and become a giant compost pile in the middle of a lake. We're trying to see if we can do some sort of conservation on it. The most interesting part about this, of course, is the way the Aymara do their uh, negotiations, their business here. It involves everybody, the opportunity to talk. Everybody participates in that, and they always come to a consensus. There never seems to be a very authoritative decision, but a consensus between all of them. Si eso es su decisión, estaré de acuerdo. Les apoyaré. Uh, after talking with the community, and you saw the big long meeting there, yeah. um, they um, came to the idea that okay, the stone will stay here. Uh, these meetings are not about conflict, they're about compromise. And the big surprise for me was the boat. They the do, boat is staying here. They do like the boat. I offered to take it back to Watahata to fix it up, to do conservation. He said, we're Aymara, we got the to Torah, we know what we're doing. So one of the agreements we have for leaving the boat and leaving the stone here is that uh, they're gonna carve this up into uh, their own little monolith. It's gonna form back there, it's gonna form the center of a, a new plaza, and it's gonna be uh, the monolith there. And the plaza's gonna be named after the project. Did we prove what we set out to prove? Is this how Tiwanaku was built? When we are talking about Tiwanaku, we're talking about thousands of years of history. We've proved it's possible to transport this stone onto Torah reeds from one side of the lake to the other. We recorded how much Totora reed we used and how many people would be required to actually do this. And when you boil it down, it's actually a very doable scenario. This is not impossible. This requires work, hard work, and a lot of ingenuity. But once you got that going, you can build a city. <laughs>